Right. So Les, we've been talking about correlation and diversification. So I want to I want to show you some of Mel Melchiel's uh, discussion here. If this is, I don't know how loud this will be. So, so this is this is the guy who wrote Random Walk Down Wall Street. You may have read. I've never read it. I've read. Usually when a book like that comes out and there's a bunch of books that respond to it, I read the books that respond to it. It's, it's got everything in their book plus the newer stuff. So I, I read Dr. Lowe's Adapted Market Hypothesis, but he's going to challenge what I just told you all last class. So let's see if he can change it. Okay. Another last that I can hear about the Dr. Lowe's what we learned from the financial crisis is diversification doesn't work. It's clear that diversification doesn't work anymore. But there's been a point of markets going down. The US market's down. Europe is down. Latin America is down. China is down. All the markets go down. Diversification, uh, uh, what happens is that the correlations of markets go to one, particularly when they're going down, participation fails to just when you need it most. We don't want to diversify anymore, uh, and uh, that's the end of the story. I don't think I quite said that. I didn't say we don't diversify anymore, but um, but anyway, he's talking about the asset class level, he's not talking the security level. Uh, Let's take the argument uh, as it is. Uh, are all the markets uh, so correlated? Let's take a couple of markets. These are rolling correlations. Let's take the correlation between the bond market and the stock market. Now, how is he being a little deceptive here? You remember? What bond market is he looking at? Probably treasuries. <laughs> Gives them a huge advantage when you use treasuries in 08 because they look wonderful in 08. They're a great diversifier. No one buys treasuries in normal markets. Uh, I, I think I told some of y'all the story. I bought a ten, I, I bought a treasury when I was working in the investment company, and my boss got mad at me. So we don't buy treasuries here. It's like I just bought it just to see what it was like. I mean, it was that's how he just he was all right. He had to apologize to me the next day because he got so mad at me. It was like. I just bought a five thousand dollar in treasury. I just want to see how you buy treasuries. So people don't buy treasuries. He's going to show you the correlation between treasuries and stocks, and he's going to see see negative correlation again. You can already, if you were there, what could you tell him? Positive correlation during inflationary periods. Negative correlation during non-inflationary, and when people aren't thinking about inflation. I mean, it's. He doesn't mention that at all, but it's pretty obvious from the charts. Well, the correlation of the bond market and the stock market has become negative. I mean, the bonds have become even less diversified. So it's not the case that all the markets have moved up and down together. Bonds have been a great diversifier. Treasuries. Now, is that an amazing thing to say? Treasuries are a great diversifier in a major financial crisis. Is that shocking? <laughs> They're particularly diversifying. They're wonderful. They're wonderful things. So yeah, if you expect a major crisis without inflation, then yeah, treasuries are a great diversifier. I'm going to ask you, what's the highest pro what's the highest allocation you're ever going to have in treasuries in your portfolio? Do you think? Never more than what? Maybe five percent if you're lucky. Is five percent going to do much for you? It's not going to do anything for you. <clears throat> Gold has been a great diversifier. Uh, gold is basically protection from Armageddon. And if in fact, well, last year was a pretty bad market. How did gold do last year? It didn't do well because the US dollar strengthened so much. But we're, we're 0 for 2 this last crisis. The world, uh, uh, if uh, Greece uh, completely uh, 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 defaults at the end of the week and uh, uh, the uh, there's a run on uh, Italian bonds and Spanish bonds and so forth. Gold will probably be over two thousand dollars now. They're not going to go out and buy the gold. The point is diversification is 
So he's mentioned two asset classes, gold and treasuries, which combined will almost never be more than 10% of your portfolio, unless you're just absolutely crazy investor. But anyway. Not yet. There are the assets that help you diversify. And even when the correlations are very, very high, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't diversify. Because let's look at the correlations between emerging markets and developed markets. So now he's kind of, so this is, this gets down to your definition of risk. All right. So I think you're going to have to struggle with this because we never ask you to. So we just give you this stuff in the textbook. And uh, you should have heard of Warren Buffett. Um, you he was talking rather negatively about college finance courses and what we teach you. But um, we teach you this stuff like it's so natural. Standard deviation is a measure of risk. And you're going to have to come to terms with what really is risk. He's going to say, well, forget that. It's you got to look a longer period of time. So, yeah, everything blew up in one year, but that's not risk. So what's your definition of risk? So that is risk according to academia. It's standard deviation. But he's saying, no, that's not risk. You got to look over time and how did emerging markets do through the whole cycle? And that's really the definition of risk. All right. Well. I want you to pay close attention to his allocation to emerging markets and ask if you would ever use that correlation. I mean, that. So you can see that they tend to be very correlated. That is to say, when the developed market stores, emerging market stores, when the developed market uh, crash, emerging market crash. Again, during this uh, uh, tangible wallet yesterday, where the public market said he was zero rated returns, even though the correlations were very high, you would have been very happy to have some emerging markets in your portfolio because they gave you a 10% annual rate of return. Now, how much would you have in emerging markets? Let's say you'd have 10%. All right, so you got 10% in emerging markets, 5% in gold, 10% in treasuries. These two help you in 2008, but they're horrible over this whole period. And emerging markets would have killed you in 08, but were great over the whole period. You put them together and what'd you get? To his argument over the cycle. You didn't get anything. So, so why do we conveniently change our definition of risk depending on which slide we're showing? You got to decide what's a risk to you. I told you my definition. My definition is in the middle of crisis, this might be different than anything I've ever seen before in the whole world's coming to an end. That's my definition of risk. It has nothing to do with standard deviation. It's, a, it's the Japan stock market in 1989. I'm going to lose 85, 90% of my money and it's not going to come back for 30 years and I'm about to retire. That's, that's a disaster, isn't it? Nothing he's saying is going to protect you from that. So that's my definition. My definition has nothing to do with volatility. And it's it's that, is this crisis different than the last one? So, so even though the correlations were working, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't diversify. <laughs> now, the other thing he's convenient about, he's comparing U.S. markets to emerging. So that particular time emerging did well. But there's other times emerging does really badly and U.S. does well. So you're diversifying, did nothing for risk, but greatly hurts your return. But this particular time, it helps you. So does that help his argument much? I'm not really sure where he's going. So, hey, I found a time when emerging really helped you. So you should diversify. Yeah, but if I diversify the next time, it really hurt me. I don't see where he's going with risk on this one. It's so bizarre. Anyone want to defend him? He's not here. Don't you wish you were here? I always wish I could debate these people on public. They put me to shame, I'm sure, because he wrote a book and I haven't. But So again, that's a new lesson that we are supposed to learn. I think uh, that's not all what. Now let's put these things together. We know that this was the first decade of the 2000s was the lost decade for investing. People got disgusted with the stock market. You didn't make any money on the stock market. But what if you did? All right, so he's got, I can't see what that is. Can y'all see? And I'm thinking the percentage. My Getting close. Business. All right. So 33% not bonds, 33% what? Treasuries. No one's going to have 30. Now, if you do the, the Barclays Ag, I think it is about 30, 40% treasuries, but most investors don't do treasuries. 35 US like 17% emerging. He has an equal allocation to emerging 
that he does with developed markets. So he's defending academia by also destroying academia because academia would you would never, you know, emerging markets is a small percentage relative to the developed. You would never put the same allocation to emerging in the in developed markets. That is well. He should do a presentation 10 years later and show how this portfolio would have done because it would have been pretty freaky bad. Um, and I've got percentages that I recommend for a 50-year-old investor. Yeah, 50-year-old investor. Oh, my word. I don't. I should run the numbers sitting on the show y'all what this would have done. It would have been, you would have been. You would have been much better just putting all your money in U.S. stocks. Not only would it gotten a much higher return, but the volatility would have been pretty good during that particular decade. And the percentages that have been in random loss for the last 10 years have been a third bond, a third U.S. stock, 17% in emerging markets, foreign, and 17% in developed foreign markets. I'm not saying this is the, necessarily the greatest uh, uh, allocation, but that's the one that I have been recommending. So much he's actually recommending the allocation. Okay. Would any of y'all buy that recommend that allocation? Let's say, and he keeps talking about bonds like there's bonds are one thing. They're not. They're a lot of bonds with very different characteristics of risk. He doesn't talk about high yield here. He doesn't talk about uh, mortgage backs. Um, so I wish I could see the more detailed allocation he has. We had this debate at USA because we were actually advocating for a higher allocation the emerging pretty intense debate there as well. Uh, they are great diversifiers when you have a heavy allocation of bonds. When you have an allocation of only 33, they're not quite as powerful. I think the one that I suggested uh, people use is the old lesson of Brandon Watt. And we'll do two things. We'll do that versus just holding undiversified 100% U.S. stock. All right, so was I recommending 100% U.S. stocks? So I, I don't think anyone would recommend that. Um, although I did have an allocation of 100% stock hedged with options, we should try that strategy against this. That would be interesting as well. Uh, all of this is pretty heavy stocks. There's the U.S. stock market. We know it's just a terrible thing. It didn't make any money. You ended up about the same place where you were at the beginning. So what if you diversify that way and you rebalance every January? That's the calculation. You rebalance every January, you have that diversified portfolio, and what you notice is you almost doubled your money during that decade, despite the fact that that was one of the worst decades for investors, uh, probably one of the worst uh, uh, that uh, you've been free. That was something to think uh, uh, about, uh, you know, going back to the 30s uh, to think that you had uh, worse investments than that. So I would say that diversification does work and so does uh, rebalancing. All right, so get down to your definition of risk. So his diversified portfolio dropped dramatically in 08. That's our definition of risk in your, in your books. He's saying we well, got to do it over time. When you do it over time, your answer entirely depends on when you started, when you ended your data, because it radically shifts. So the U.S. markets have grossly outperformed other markets the last 20 years. So his data would look a lot different. Um, so, you know, anytime someone says something like that, I want to go back and I want to look at every 20 year period and see how often what he said actually worked. There's probably some periods where his strategy would have made zero and the U.S. market would have doubled. Um, you know, there's different periods of time. Uh, I'm not saying he's wrong and I'm right because I'm not even really sure where are we radically different. What I'm trying to emphasize, you're about to graduate to, to you know, go out into a field somewhere on a sunny day and just sit there and think about risk for about three hours because this is your career. It's all about managing risk, how you view it, how you measure it. You don't have to take my definition, but you need some definition you're comfortable with. You know, it, you've been taught in, in college and even are, are not started with that, you know, standard deviation, but he kind of says, well, standard deviation is the gold standard, and yet no one really uses it because we focus on pure risk. So he says, we don't even, 
we talk about it like we really use it and we kind of think we do, but we don't really don't. So, you know, I mean, he, he even makes that that connection that we're we're not all that consistent about it. So how do you define risk? How do you measure risk? Um, and so that's why with me, with an option strategy, especially for people in their 60s and 70s, 100% stock but hedged, if I can tell someone the worst case scenario is you lose 10%, that sounds pretty good for a 70 year old in any market. I kind of like that definition of risk. If I were 20, I wouldn't care. You know, if you're 20 and you're Japan, you lose 85%, it doesn't matter because you know, more you're going to be investing more money in, in the years ahead than you just lost. I have students that, as college students, oh, I just invested a thousand dollars and I lost like 30 percent. What should I do? And I'm like, you're, you're not going to notice that in 10 years. It won't even it be won't even be a dip in your portfolio. But if you're 70 and you have your entire portfolio and it loses 30 percent, then yeah, yeah, you got a problem. So it really depends on who you are and how you define risk. So it does the, the decline over time. Um, I don't know if he has other, he has a, a Google talk he does. I haven't listened to that one. Um, there's some pretty exciting uh, um, YouTube videos down here. I see someone disagrees with me. He is the best. So yeah, he's the best. So don't listen to me, listen to him, but you need to come up with your own idea. Um, so, uh -huh. Um, so like what advice do you have for like when that happened? Like it obviously you did with like a lot of us, like how to kind of convince yourself to like if you need to keep your same strategy or change it, like even when you're young investing. Yeah, they say strategy. So you need to have I don't know if you need a strategy as much as you need to understand what you're worried about, what scares you, what you can take. So um yeah, you've you know, I, that's why I always say go to the extremes. That's how you understand risk. So take what you're currently doing and assume 2008 happens again and, and think through that scenario and what you're going to feel like. Most people, when the markets have done well, they say, yeah, I'm fine. When the market crashes, I'll get in there. But will you really? really? Uh, I remember the end of 2008, we didn't sleep for like three months. And um, I was getting up every night. We, I would, I know all my peers are doing this, and not just me on the stock side. The bond guys are even worse. They had a worse year. I mean, not percentage wise, but relative to their history, they had a worse year than I did. So I remember getting up whenever the Japanese market. You know, I was sitting there in bed completely awake, and then when the Japanese market opened, I got up and started watching markets all morning. I was building models and all kinds of things, and it's just you. So maybe y'all never see a two thousand eight, but when it happens. Nothing, nothing you've ever learned works anymore. That's why I sold y'all that movie, The Duel. You remember that? There's sometimes the only thing that matters is survival. And you got to think so differently about it. And he's saying, no big deal. See, it fell, but it came back and you made it twice. He, he's not talking about what's going on on that part when it's sold. Uh, we always assume it's always going to come back. And that's the ultimate assumption. That didn't happen in Japan. Didn't happen in um, Argentina or Venezuela. You know, there's there's places where it really does come off the rails, and who knows? You know, the po political discussions around the world. You know, so I always my my big one is what happens when uh, President Xi attacks Taiwan? What's gonna what's the world's gonna do? Have y'all walked walk through that scenario? <laughs> what's the U.S. gonna do? What's Taiwan going to do? What's the semiconductor market going to do? What is every car in the world that needs a lot of semiconductors? What are those industries going to do? Are you, have y'all thought through that scenario? I'm retired, so I don't, I'll just, I'm going to go to Costa Rica. They got a little house there for me. I'm fine. I can eat at our restaurant the rest of my life. But what, what's going to happen? Is, is that going to happen in your lifetime? What did President Xi say? I will resolve the Taiwan issue during my tenure. Did he say, I might? I was thinking about it. We'll see. He didn't say that. What did he say? I will resolve the Taiwan. What is what is the only resolution for President Xi? There's only one, isn't there? He's going to recombine this. You know, that's a that's that's like Ukraine, Russia times, you know, to the seventh power or something. And that's the only one I'm thinking about. There's seven others that are just as big that that we haven't thought of. So. When those things happen, the issue isn't, oh, volatility and bounce around. The issue is, well, will we even recover during our lifetimes? So you have to think through those. Those are one in a million events. So when those things happened, 2008 was one of those. We did recover. We did come back. 
but in the middle of the crisis, you don't really know how you're going to behave. It's it's really it's complete uncertainty. Um, so, you know, the best bet is probably just to say, hey, this is going to come. It's me like 2008. I'm going to be scared to death. I'm going to write down exactly what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it. I'm just going to stick with it. So um, my 2008 was a little interesting. And um, I'm, I probably have told you all this anyway, but it looked it looked like a trendy market. And it really was. So I said, okay, I'm going with it. So it was just, you could just see the channel coming down. So I just went with that. I bought the bottom, sold the tops, bought the bottom. Each bottom was lower. And so I just channeled it. And I was going to do that and keep doing it, which would have been disaster. But then I realized, hey, I'm retiring next year. And my job's really stressful right now. So I just went to the cash. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was like perfect, but pure luck. It wasn't strategy. <laughs> It wasn't strategy. It was my job is too stressful right now. I don't want to be worried about my pension plan. I'm just going to cash and I'm just staying out of it. So just pure luck. But, you know, who knows how you're going to react in those situations. It's it's not easy. I mean, you pick the field that pays really, really well, but it pays really, really well because you're making extremely big decisions. And when it's not fun, it's really, really not fun. <laughs> It's very, very stressful. So sometime in your career, you're going to be in that where it's just like, I don't, this is not enjoyable at all. Um, and then you come out of it and you're fine and you look back on it and it's kind of the best part of your life because you learn so much. So uh, I'm not helping y'all, but um, I mean, why did your textbooks help you with these? I mean, your textbooks are not all that useful <laughs> uh, when it comes to these extremes. Um, all right, so correlation when it's negative, you want more risk because that's when that negative correlation helps you. That's what he was saying about gold uh, and long treasuries. Low correlation means risk reduction, but that's assuming correlation is a thing that is reliable that you can predict. Um, not yet. Some of you have me know that I do forecast the betas. Betas are unstable, but I think you can actually get a pretty good sense of what beta is. I don't think that's, that works for correlation. Correlation is not something that you expect going forward because it depends on the environment. So, you know, correlations can move to many different places. Um, are we getting more correlated around the world or less so? There is some sense that globalization is, we're pulling back. And so maybe we'll become less, less correlated than we have in the past. Uh, I showed y'all uh, the Bridgewater article and you see my view of it. And so we're going to measure this with value at risk. Um, so I'm not a huge value at risk fan. We used it at USA very effectively, but an area I thought worked pretty well. We did stochastic a value at risk, but I thought it worked pretty well there, but that was outside the financial markets. Um, but I want to share this guy's views of it because I think there's something here. So I had a, a managed futures um, hedge fund manager. I don't know if y'all know managed futures. So he did really well on OA because he was doing exactly what I did. Is that trend? Managed futures, they find a trend and they it's like surfing. I've never surfed, but I mean, it's like a wave. They find that trend and they jump on it. And 2008 was a very trendy market where it's, you could just see it going in a particular direction. And so they did extremely well. Uh, he must have been a really smart guy because he was from the UK, he had a had a strong accent, so it sounded smart to me. I'm there with my Texas drawl. I was like, I feel, yeah, I don't know what, but smart guy. I felt stupid, but he did his entire presentation. He didn't mention VAR one time, his entire presentation. And I'm not a big VAR fan, so I wasn't like upset with him, but I just said, you know, I, I'm not a huge VAR fan, but you're kind of the first head, you're the first head fund manager to go through your entire presentation and not mention it once. And this is what he told me. I even got his permission to repeat it. Some of y'all might've seen this before. Um, so this is his reason for not using VAR. Uncertainty and risk, he says it's like a cliff. And it's a cliff without any protections. So people just stay back 10, 20, 20 yards because it's dangerous. I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, but you know, you don't, well, some people go right up to the edge, but you know, you're gonna stay back a little bit. Um, so he says VAR is like building a fence along the cliff. So now we got this fence. And so now everybody feels really comfortable going right up to the fence and leaning against it to look over the cliff. 
And if everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, what's going to happen? The whole fence is going to collapse and it's going to be a bigger disaster than you ever seen before. Um, and so what VAR ignores is that a lot of people are doing the same thing at the same time, which means when they all stop doing that, it's going to be a very concentrated. We'll talk about this later when we talk about long-term capital management. What happens when the largest hedge funds all, all, are all in the same trade and that market crashes? That's back to that liquidity thing. You know, when does liquidity become an issue? Is when it's not when everybody's buying the thing, it's when everybody finishes buying and then that thing starts falling and they start selling and that concentration really kills you. And where could this happen? You know, to me, one of the examples you always bring up is BlackRock. I forget the name of their system. Let's see if I can find it. Is that it? Aladdin? I can't spell it. Did I spell it right? No, it's two Ds. So we had one student get, get a job at BlackRock and he was working on their system. I'm not sure it's this one, but, but BlackRock has a system that just permeates the industry. A lot of people use it all over the place. Is it possible it has some errors in it, some problems with it? I thought it was incredibly sophisticated because the BlackRock people are pretty sophisticated. And then our former student, he was telling me what he's doing. I was like, I can't believe they're that far behind on just basic technology. So I was kind of kind of made me nervous. Um, it, it makes me nervous when so many people use one particular way of measuring risk with, with one source because any errors in that software are gonna are gonna go everywhere. And BlackRock is pretty dominant. You know, it's the biggest fund manager out there, especially on the fixed income side. Um, so, so my view, VAR tells us to ignore risk that have low probabilities. So if your risk tolerance is 1%, you're saying, you know what? Let's assume that 1%, or worse never happens. I don't think assuming bad stuff don't happen is, is risk management. <laughs> it's risk, you know, avoid, you know, uh, ignoring, you're just ignoring the risk. That's actually, I've already told you all, that's actually the only risk I care about. I care about the risk that happens 1% or, or less. It's because you know, it's, it's those extremes. I've been through several of them in my career. I should have never been through any of them because they were all statistically almost impossible. So those are the ones I, I obsess about, uh, the extreme stream. Um, how we manage investment risk is inconsistent with how we manage other risks. So everybody buys homeowner's insurance, but very few people buy portfolio insurance. And why is it? Well, you may see the pricing's not as good or whatever, but my contention is people do this without thinking. And people don't do this without thinking. It's not a conscious thing to say, oh, well, you know, with homeowners insurance, the pricing is really accurate given the risk. And so I should buy homeowners. But when I look at my stock portfolio, I don't think people are making those decisions. So why do we do it in one area, not the other? Because the industry makes money selling this. The industry doesn't make money selling that. So we, we our risk management is based on how the industry's compensation is set up. Hey, what risk was that? You remember from paper one or from the essay, career risk, right? We're making decisions based on the career risk and the people selling this stuff, not based on what we need. Now, it's, it's true. Stock insurance is much more expensive than homeowner's insurance from a relative standpoint. That's because the risk is much greater. The chances that your portfolio falls 50% is much greater than half your house burning down. You know, you're, you're much more likely. So it's going to be more expensive, but it should be. I would contend, though, that the in stock insurance is probably more accurately priced than a homeowner's. You're probably overpaying for homeowners, and you're probably accurately playing, paying or closely playing. But we just don't think about it. So it's kind of just we're doing things based on habit, not based on any kind of intense analysis. Like I asked my PNC class, why do you buy parts B and C of the auto insurance? I think it's a waste of money. But most of them didn't know if they had it. So because we just do things on habit, right? We don't really think about it. We're spending money on stuff. Yeah, it's only 120 bucks a year, but it's 120 bucks a year that you could buy probably $100,000 of insurance in part A. You know, you gotta, you think about uh, how you manage risk, not based on what the people selling you think you should do because their, their incentives are not aligned with yours. You do it based on what makes sense for you. The other thing I talk about with 
portfolio insurance is this reversion idea. Homeowners insurance is going to rise if there's a fire outside your house. No question. It's like the guy in Medina always talk about it. You know, the Medina dam's about to burst and he calls USA to buy flood insurance. And the first thing he said was, well, what about 30 minutes? And I knew exactly what they told him. There's a 30 day wait period. And he said, oh, 30 days. What about 30 minutes? Because there's a flood coming to his house. Yeah, he, it wasn't that it was too expensive. He couldn't buy it. It didn't exist. With portfolios, I think it's the exact opposite. I think for portfolios, the insurance on portfolios is the cheapest right when the fire is outside your house. Because when portfolio insurance is cheap, it means no one's worried about risk, which is, I think, when you should be most really worried about it. So it's like it's like homeowner's insurance being on sale when there's a fire right outside your house. So I actually think it makes a lot of sense. So I I, I will almost always be doing option trades when the VIX falls below 10, just, just almost always. It's just like cheap insurance. Why not hedge? I do have blogs that we've kind of talked about for older investors and younger investors. For young investors, yeah, I'm just like, put it all in stocks and be riskier. I, you know, I'm a small cap value kind of guy. I would definitely do some, I, I was showing the Investment Society my dashboard. I would definitely be using that dashboard to decide where the overweight based entirely on valuations that are different than their history. That I think that makes some sense. Um, but if I were you, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be worried about, you know, the volatility or even the crisis. You know, if if the world comes to an end, if the U.S. stock market falls 99 percent, it doesn't really matter. Nothing you have is going to work. Right. That that scenario for me. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, but you, you got your jobs or whatever, you know that. So if our sun blows up, and comes a white dwarf. It really doesn't matter what your portfolio looks like. All right. You're everybody's dead. So it doesn't really matter. But if you get a Japan type of scenario, for me, that would be disaster. But for you at your age, it still wouldn't be a disaster. You can lose 85% of your portfolio and it doesn't really matter. You, you may not believe that, but yeah, I mean, you, you can. So even at your age, you, you can. So that's why I don't believe, I don't buy the 90-10 at all. It just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Um, I, I would love to show you Vanguard, but it, the internet's way too slow right now. Um, but very, very important. One thing you, you might want to think about is when you start your career is how does your firm actually define these things? What is, what is their philosophy? And what you might find is they may not have one or they may just be assuming it's textbook and then, you know, it's not all that consistent with the textbook. So asking those kind of questions would be really healthy. You might find that their answer is a career risk type of answer. Their goal is not to lose clients. It's not to protect your clients, but it's not to lose clients. So some of y'all are really on the essay. I like the way you said it. Uh, I forget, uh, Jonah's not here. I like the way, uh, wait, how do you say it? Career risk is, uh, oh, I can't remember. I have to look at his paper and show it to it, but a, a good answer on, on career risk, but it's putting your career ahead of the client's risk because that's, that's how you're compensated. And your cover is that everybody's doing it so since everybody's doing it, it's not all that risky. You're only risky if you're doing stuff other people aren't doing. That's when you lose clients. So convention innovation is just not encouraged. The PBGC, uh, interesting. There's the ones that insure pension plans. And several years ago, they said, you know what? We got all this money sitting here from these uh, premiums we're getting, insuring all these plans. We, we need to allocate that differently. Let's, let's put this in the stock market. We should have money in the stock market. All right. So think about that. The, the, the firm that's using taxpayers backing to hedge pension plans says we should have stock market risk. So 2008 happens. What happens? They lose all their money to the stock market and then all these pension plans go under and then they pick up the pension plans when they don't have. It's, it's like, can, can we find a strategy such that when, when the crisis hits, we're in really bad shape? Um, and, and Taleb's going to talk about that quite a bit. Uh, it's, so he, he says we set ourselves up for the crisis. We're actually creating this crisis because we're, we're loading up on so much of the same stuff. Um, so they should have done some bar analysis. And specifically, again, go to the extreme. 
I might say that like 40 more times this semester, go to the extreme. They should have gone to the extreme and say, what does this mean in a real, real crisis? What will this mean? Uh, because it really blew up on them. They did it right before 2008 and just really, really blew up on them. Um, so at the extremes, the unusual things happen completely out of line with anything you're taught in your textbooks. Normal distributions, correlations, standard deviations, none of that makes sense. Things that seem uncorrelated, in fact, you can't think of why they'd be correlated. Suddenly they become, they come, become correlated simply because they're not treasuries. Or even in 2022, you know, it's hard to think uh, other than buying oil, what you would have done in 2022 that could have really protected you because it was just a horrible year for investing. It wasn't a crisis where losing 50, 60%, but you're definitely losing quite a bit of money. Um, so we're gonna talk about this contextual risk management um, a little bit later. So focus more on career risk and client risk in our, our industry. When the investment community is worried, um, yeah, USA had a, it was the CEO of our property casualty company, one of my favorite people. I won't say his name, but a really smart guy. Um, he was always so complimentary. I mean, it's kind of funny because we talked about, oh, Ronnie's so smart about all this. And he was like so much smarter than I was, but he was so nice about just, Here's Ron, he's gonna to talk to us. But he, one exec council meeting, he goes, you investment people, you have all these commercials about how you're gonna manage our risks. So you don't, you can sleep easy, we're managing all the risk. And then you say you're expecting a crisis to come. come and so you reduce your stock allocation from 60 to 55. If you think crisis is coming, you should go from 60 to zero. <laughs> Why do you go from 60 to 55? Well, because you're worried about career risk. You don't want to lose clients if you're wrong. But so and I, I thought it was very, very astute what he said. Just, just made a lot of sense. Um, why don't you go further? And just, it's just the way you are compensated. Uh, so why don't we go lower? Don't want to reduce our risk more? Uh, there was one presentation I saw. Um, oh, he was talking about the crisis coming. He was adamant the crisis was coming. He wasn't saying, I think, I believe. He was like, this is it. This is going to be terrible. And someone asked him how he's investing. He said, oh, I'm just keeping my portfolio 60, 40, not making any changes. So do you not believe what you just said? And he said, it's like, that's the best strategy. I think the world's going to come to the end. So I'm going to keep my heavy stock allocation. It made no sense. So we kind of, we're, we're kind of inconsistent here. But you're probably going to find this. Why don't we reduce our stock allocation more? And that's for our environment, 60 to 55 is considered a pretty major move. It's like, wow, are you kidding? You can go from 60 to 55. You could, your alpha could you could hurt your alpha by 50 basis points. That could be killer. So um, it's a tough industry. That's why I, I talk about family office. Family office, they can say, we don't care. We're in for the long haul. You think stock market's in bad shape? Yeah, we'll go to zero percent stocks. We're fine with that. So yeah, it's it's there's places where you can't get away with that kind of investing. So here's my quote. This won't work well on a t-shirt, but I do think this is what finance is doing. When someone's got a gun to your head, that's not when you should be worried about your cholesterol level. That's what we do in finance. And why do we do that in finance? Well, what model are you going to use to figure out the guy's going to shoot you? What model do we have to measure cholesterol? We do that really well, don't we? So what are we doing finance? Someone's got a gun to our head, but cholesterol is really easy to measure. So we're going to focus on our cholesterol. level. It doesn't make sense, but that's what we do. We focus, and, and we're going to see this with Doug Hubbard. We ignore the most important risk because they're hard to measure. We focus on the least important risk because they're really easy to measure. doesn't make a lot of sense, but someone needs to work this out for a T-shirt slogan. I don't know, could you word it better than that? I don't know, there's gotta be a better way to, to say that. That's a pretty extreme though, isn't it? <laughs> That's two pretty extreme things together. Um, all right, so let's think about VAR again. There's three types of Vars, parametric, historical, and stochastic. You're gonna do two of them on your last project, parametric and historical. Parametric, very, very simple. You did it on the first exam, you do it on the second exam. Uh, it's just using that normal distribution, just trying to figure out where where are you going to cut the tail off of the distribution. 
Historical is exactly the same as stochastic. You're running simulations, except for your simulations, you're just pulling them from history. I used historical VAR at USAA. It was really, really interesting to me because we had a, we spent a lot of money on a stochastic model, which is simulation, a lot of actuaries, a lot of mathematicians. And I took that to the CEO and his response was, that's just a black box, I can't trust it. If I went back and just ran everything through a historical period, he was perfectly fine with that. I could get anything approved. And, and when I got him to approve the pension plan change, um, I mean, my models look great because we're protecting ourselves from falling interest rates. And guess what interest rates have just done for 20 years? So I'm showing him, it's like, yeah, look look how much this would have helped us. And I even mentioned, you know, I'm showing you a period of time where rates have fallen. And he's like, no, no, as long, and he was like, I don't care as long as you're showing me actual history. So that was his idea. I don't know why he had such a low trust of our modeling. I don't know why he trusted my historical data because I could have gotten all that wrong as well. But he, he said, if you give me actual history, I'll believe it. If you give me a black box, I won't believe it. So sometimes you got to kind of play around with, you know, your audience and see what they're willing to accept. Um, so Kasich, I think, is by far the best if you got some really good mathematicians behind you and some people who know what they're doing. It's it's pretty intense math. It's pretty intense computer models. Um, you're putting in assumptions. You're not always using a normal curve. In fact, a lot of times you won't. So USA does this very, very effectively looking at hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and those type of things. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's about as sophisticated as you can get uh, with really you know strong math behind it and a lot of and one thing i loved about the actuaries is uh even though their models were far better calibrated than anything we ever use on the finance side they still didn't trust them they were always kind of questioning them and questioning them again i remember working with mary it's like mary do you have your model yet no i can get it better i can get it better it's like we've been working on this for six months it's like no I, i'm almost there so um but I like that, you know, people are saying, you know, you should always be skeptical of these models. Um, what's that famous saying? I think I have it later in here. All models are wrong. Some are useful. Have y'all heard that before? Um, so, so, so true. Uh, which means there's a lot of models that aren't useful at all. There's this complete waste. They're all wrong, but some are useful to give you insights. <clears throat> So we talked we talked about this before. So it's it's powerful. Historical is a little struggle because you really want a lot of data, but you have to kind of question if you go back 50, 60 years, if that's really telling you anything, because the world really has changed quite dramatically. Markets have changed, information. So it's uh, expenses, a lot of things have changed. So uh, it's tough. Your most of your banks, I think I've seen some of y'all say that they go back three years. Um, so that's that's why it's interesting comparing 2019 to 2020, because 17, 18, 19 were pretty tame years. And then 2020 happens where you're just off the charts. And yeah, so, you know, it's, so it's really interesting to compare those two, two years with the banks because it really is a pretty drastic that March what happened. Um, what happens if your two models are inconsistent? So this is something you're going to find in your project. Uh, I'm going to have you do something that no one would actually do in practice, but I think if you're working with a financial planner, you should ask them for this. So they're they're using parametric analysis, most of them. And they're saying, hey, you move this portfolio, we'll increase your return by 20 basis points, reduce your risk by this much. And you just ask the question, that's fine. Compare your portfolio to my portfolio last 20 years and show me. Say, well, last 20 years, it was the exact opposite. You had a higher return, less, less risk. But going forward, it's kind of an awkward conversation. That's is not the same. We, we have a recommendation that's going to be completely different than what you saw historically, and this is the reason why. But you're going to see that in your in your projects. So, all right. Well, it must be boring. And am not that boring, really. Everybody's just leaving. This is like the most interesting conversation in the entire you're going to be doing this for 50 years and I'm boring y'all. So what are you going to do when you have to do it for 50 years? Okay. I just, I'm, I'm too passionate about this stuff. Um, all right. So uh, for your project, we'll talk about the project more after, um, probably right before spring break. So you can maybe get into it. But essentially the project is, it's got several pieces to it. I want you to get exposed to some stuff that you don't normally see undergraduate. 
you will create an official frontier, which is kind of cool. It, it does all the work for you, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. We'll look into that, and and I'll show you how how I have built have it built. I want to do a style analysis. Um, you might read this article before you do do the project. It's it's a pretty easy read. Um, so do a style analysis. Style analysis is still quite common. You won't actually do a style analysis the way we're going to do it in the project when you get real life because the computer is going to do it for you. But the advantage is. If you do it yourself manually, then you see how it's all working. Then when the computer does it for you, you you understand what you're actually doing underlying. And then attribution. So attribution is pretty common for an entry level job. Again, you won't do the attribution where we're going to do it. The computer is going to do it all for you. Whether you're using um, oh man, there's so many there's so many software packages out there, Morningstar and all the others. Uh, but doing it by hand, I think, is really helpful so you see exactly what it's doing. So you know you know what an information ratio is. You know what a um, batting average is and those type of things. Um, now, we are doing a class on Tuesdays that use Bloomberg to do attribution. And if you don't know what attribution is, you might come to the class. So Tuesdays at 6, right before this class. Um, this next Tuesday, the guy who does it for USA, he's going to come by and show us how to do it because I haven't used the software in so long. So he's going to come by and show us how to do it. Um, he's really, really good at this. He knows it backwards and forwards. But um, I don't know if y'all know what after you may know what attribution is. Can anybody give me a definition? Y'all heard it before? Portfolio attribution? No. I just look it up and it's oh. like decomposing the yeah. Oh, I can't spell it. Decomposing. Well, I say returns. Um, you could certainly say risk. It's hard to say attribution decomposes. That's interesting. What's that? Is that Investopedia or? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's. Um, so a good example, we did a portfolio last week. It was kind of interesting because we only had one day and we just stuck 10 stocks into it, I think, or, or maybe five. And it showed us that our portfolio was up 87 basis points. And then it showed us where that came from. So this stock added 50, this stock subtracted 20. That was just for one day. So we just happened to have Meta in the portfolio. Meta was up like three and a half percent that day. So you could see it. So attribution can can be contributors and distractors from returns. I think that's incredibly powerful. Almost all portfolio managers do that. So they'll come in at the end of the year and they say, okay, here's the 10 stocks that added the most to their return. Here's the 10 stocks that just detracted the most from return. So our top 10, they added 5% to our return. The bottom 10, they subtracted 4%. You could also say, your alpha. So who contributed most to your alpha? So you beat the market by 1%. Where did that come from? So you can do that kind of thing. You can, I don't know what, what all they have in there. You contrast stock or security selection to industry or sector selection. That's a really powerful one. So you'll, if you take the CFA exam, you'll, you'll have this probably in part three of the CFA exam. Uh, but so let's say you were up, your alpha was 2%. So you beat the market by 2%. So you might say security selection was minus 1%. Sector selection was 3%. So you had the right sectors. You picked tech. That's really, really good. But the tech stocks you picked didn't do all that well relative to other tech stocks. That's that's kind of important, especially if you're telling your client, we're really good at security selection and we try to be neutral on sector and say, okay, well, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> look like you're making your bets on sector. And then, the sec the, then you're going to say, which sectors? That's pretty powerful. Oh, we over energy in 2022, and boy, that made a big difference, even though we didn't have 
you know, we had more in, in, in Chevron than we did in Exxon and Exxon beat Chevron. So we didn't pick the right company, but we were over allocated in energy and we we're under allocated on technology. That would be really interesting, wouldn't it? So you kind of see where, where you're making the right decisions. A lot of managers say we're neutral on sectors. So you'd expect sector to be close to zero and everything be stock selection. But then it's going to be where did selection work and where did it retract? And that would be interesting. So um, while well, security selection worked really well in tech stocks, but man, we messed up in utility stocks. Why is that? What was it? Go talk to the utility uh, analysts. What were they recommending? What was going on there? Um, so it's you can get a lot, a lot of that type of uh, information. Um, you can get um, the current allocation, beta, PE ratio, et cetera, versus your benchmark. And that's really powerful. You'll see a lot of firms that say, hey, our PE ratio is 10% below the market. So we're value investors, we're kind of cheap, but our expected growth is higher than the market. And they'll show that and say, hey, this is this is world position. So it's really, really powerful. The reason I bring all this up is if I were you, I would, you don't have to take our Bloomberg class, but if I were you, I would build a portfolio in Bloomberg and start doing this attribution so you can actually show it in an interview. Say, yeah, I built a portfolio. It just it may not be good attribution and you can obviously cheat and just change it and tell them, you know, they're not going to know. Um, so you just build a portfolio to do the attribution. Uh, pretty powerful stuff. Really, really insightful. Um, you could even say, hey, our portfolio underperformed, but it underperformed when the market was up 10 percent, but our beta was 0.8. So you'd, you would expect this to underperform. You know, we have a lower beta. We're a lower risk portfolio. So that's when you get into things like the trainer and the and the Jensen. So yeah, we we made nine and a half percent. The market was up ten, but our beta is only 0.8. So relative to our risk, we actually did quite well. And so some people will will do that. Not necessarily the sharp ratio, but Jensen and trainer would definitely make some sense. So pretty powerful stuff. And then you can you can you can add countries, which is really really interesting. Well, we picked all the right stocks in Japan, but we shouldn't have been in Japan. <laughs> so our Japanese stocks beat the Japan market by a good 5%, but Japan was one of the worst performing markets. So whose fault is that? Who's making decisions? Why do we pick Japan? Our currencies. Hey, our Japan stocks did great. And Japan's stock market was one of the strongest markets in the world in yen, and the dollar appreciated 30%. So, you know, what are we, what are we going to do? So, it, it gets really, really quite, quite interesting. You can do it by market cap. And this one's actually a pretty interesting one. There's been some studies that show the majority of the outperformance of large cap managers isn't them picking the right large cap, it's them putting small cap in a large cap portfolio. So they're not actually beating the market, they're actually cheating and buying another asset class because small cap tend to outperform large cap. They're just taking more risk. So, hey, if I wanted to hire a manager that was 80% large and 20% small, I would have done that. I hired you as a large cap manager, you're cheating by buying small cap. I have a small cap manager already and they beat the market. When small cap unperforms, you're going to hurt me. So you can, you can see exactly what the manager is doing. So it's really, really cool stuff. Um, we used to do this in Excel. I mean, you can get, uh, you really can do a lot of this. Uh, the math is not that complex. It all adds up to one. Um, it's, it's really, really interesting math. You can also do this on the fixed income side. And attribution on fixed income, the models are much more sophisticated. There's a lot more of them, but you got things like duration, convexity and credit. Those are the main ones. So where did you take your risk and how did it come out? So our benchmark is five year duration. We thought rates were going to rise. So we were four year duration that added X basis points to our portfolio. 
uh, we thought rates were going to be really volatile. So we bought convexity. We want a really high convex portfolio. Interest rates actually settled down quite a bit. So that hurt us 50 basis points. We were expecting a recession. So we moved up in quality. Our portfolio um, had, was single A rated. The benchmark is double B, triple B plus and spreads actually narrowed and that hurt. You know, you can do each one. You can look at sectors or sector weights. 2008, that was a huge one. USA had one of its worst years on the fixed income side because USA's theory was let's buy heavily regulated industries that protects us from uh, mergers and acquisitions and LBOs. Well, that means banks. So they're out over allocated to banks. That's not good in 2008. You probably don't want to be over allocated to banks in a year known as the financial crisis. So it gets really good. Um, you can do that kind of analysis. We're going to try all three of these, I hope, this semester in that class. We're going to start with a real, real simple U.S. stock portfolio and just do the basics. And then we're going to try a, um, a, a global portfolio and just see if we can do some attribution there. And then if we have time, we'll do a fixed income portfolio, which I think would be really, really, really interesting. Uh, oh, I forgot the, um, and then you have the, the, the um, uh, where you have governments structured corporate, you know, you can, you can break it down and bonds lend themselves a lot more to attribution um, than, than stocks do because there's a lot of things you can look at. The negative thing I found on attribution is the plug. So it really irritated me. You might say, okay, our alpha was, because uh, your alpha is not very big to start with. Our alpha was a 0.75%, uh, 10 basis points came from this, five came from that, uh, 25 came from that, minus 10 came from that. I don't know if that adds up to, and then other is 83. And that that was irritating to me. So, okay, well, what's the other? And that's the plug to get on work. Because they interact with each other, and when they interact with each other, you end up with these. So you don't have that problem with the stocks because you know it's you don't have as many things going on, and the alpha uses are much, much bigger. So that can be a little irritating. We used um, I won't type it on Bloomberg, I mean on um, in the internet, because I don't want a bad site to come up, but we used a company called Bond Edge. Um, there was another one. Oh, I forget the. What is the other? There was one, I think it's a, it's a Solomon or something. So there's a few of these. So on the bond side, they usually, they're specifically built for probably BlackRock as theirs as well, but I can't show you theirs. But you might want to try Bond Edge's website. Just be careful how you type it. Um, you might want to say uh, Bond Attribution and then Bond Edge and see if that, I'll try that. <laughs> It looks that looks safe, doesn't it? <laughs> Would you name your fixed income firm Bond Edge? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I mean, someone other than Carlos. I mean, um, so yeah, analyze holding distribution performance. Um, you're, you're trying to figure out, you don't want to say, hey, we beat the market by 2%. You want to know why, where was it? And if you think you beat the market because of your credit and you look at it, you didn't, it was duration. You say, I, I thought we were neutral on duration. Well, we miscalculated the benchmark, you know, whatever. You start figuring out that what you thought was skill is really just, you're just lucky. And that's good to know that it was luck and not skill. So um, so they, I don't know how good their website is, except all cookies, I, I guess I can. Um, insights. I love it when they have a button that says insight, um, fixed income and data. So whatever they have, I don't know what all they have, but very impressive firm. We use, we use their stuff. Uh, I interviewed the only time I interviewed for a, a job I almost took while I was at USA. Well, I couldn't take it because they didn't offer it to me, but it was a firm 
they wanted someone to do attribution for them. Um, it was a firm that did the portfolio for a large life insurance company. Um, I didn't quite have the quant skills to do it, but I had done this kind of stuff before. So I was kind of, you know, you thought I might try it. Um, so it's, it's something firms are spending money on. They're willing to allocate to it. It's, it's pretty expensive because you have to have a full-time person there. And over time, they got to figure out how to prove themselves that they're actually adding value other than just giving people numbers. So you, you have to be pretty aggressive to say, hey, I'm noticing this kind of trend in your portfolio. I don't know if you really want to do that. So you got to know fixed income extremely well. You're going to sit down with a portfolio manager. He's probably going to be a little bit touchy about someone telling them what to do. And so you got to work that relationship so you can really, really have them. I had those issues at USA because I never traded a bond in my life. And I'm now telling the fixed income people, here's your new policy. You need to do these things. And a friend of mine would sit in those meetings. I'm at my desk talking on the phone and they're in a room with the senior vice president putting me on mute, all making fun of me because I've never traded a bond in my life. I'm like, I don't care. I, I know this stuff. So, you know, you, you got to put yourself out there sometimes. So attribution. So we're going to do some uh, some real, real basic attribution. Um, if someone wants to take this project and actually do it on Bloomberg and try it, you know, maybe I'll give you some bonuses for trying it. So you can actually take, uh, let's say you, you, you pick the, you can't do the Fidelity Contra Fund because that's the one I do as an example of, but let's say you, you take their portfolio and you load it and you can actually take someone else's portfolio and load it into Bloomberg and you can do attribution against it to see, hey, that's a really good, that's a really good alpha. Oh, their, their alpha is coming all from their small cap overweights. Okay. So I thought their large cap manager, all, or it's all coming from their sector weights, whatever it is. You have a fund called Contra Fund, kind of it sounds like it's going to be going, investing in whatever is done poorly and avoiding whatever is done well, but you can kind of assess that. So we'll do some of the basics, alpha tracking. I'm not a big fan of sharp ratios in this context, but we'll, we'll look at it. Most hedge funds do sharp ratios. Trainer and Jensen, I've never seen those in real life, but if you buy Morningstar, if you buy Fact Set, they'll give you these ratios, so they will be there. Some of y'all know why I don't like these ratios, right? Y'all can guess. Any guessers on this? No takers. So the huge input on that is beta, historical beta. Assuming historical beta is going to be predicted for the future, and betas are so un unstable that I don't trust these ratios. I don't think they tell you much other than what happened the last five years. Uh, what does the sharp ratio use? Y'all remember? Doesn't use beta, it uses what did Robert Arnott talk about in his first paragraph? So sharp ratios uses standard deviation, right? So y'all remember these ratios. So um, you do see sharp ratio, but almost only with hedge funds, usually not with portfolios, and you almost never see these other two ratios. I've, I've never seen them. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. So we'll get into the project. I'll show you this, the spreadsheet. Um, I probably have it by now because I was waiting to get December and I should have December now. So I wanted to get all the way through December, 2022 and we'll look at it and you can see how we can build. It's a spreadsheet you could use in an actual life. What I'm showing y'all for this project is exactly what I did at USA. We were spending several thousand dollars on a model and we finally said, forget that. We'll just build it ourselves because you can do this in Excel pretty easily. It works just as well. And we had a lot more flexibility doing it ourselves. We could do a lot more things. So I'll show you how that works. So the second project is much easier than the first project. We're going to talk about the first paper next week. So if you're freaking out on the first paper, at least know the second paper is, is much more straightforward. Um, all right. So where we're going next is credit risk. Credit risk is a really easy problem, math problem on the second exam. Some of you are taking John Tui's class this semester. I don't know if he's gotten a lot into credit risk yet. I heard him talking about collateral earlier. So obviously some credit risk there. We're going to keep this pretty high level. It's an important risk. Obviously, um, it's one that blows up pretty badly when it does blow up. Um, but we're going to talk about how, how can we measure this, how can we get some sense of how much you should be paid for credit risk. And one thing you'll notice with credit risk, and we'll see this in the numbers, is historically, corporate bonds have more than adequately compensated for credit risk versus history. 
which is the reason the guy at USA said, we don't buy treasuries. If you look over the long-term corporate bonds more than pay their, their risk in a very almost predictable way. They, they you really do get extra compensation for that. So we'll, we'll look through that. Um, all right. I, I hope that the exam's graded by Saturday. Let's see, I've graded about 15 of the essays. Uh, some of y'all have never had me before, so it's going to be interesting because you're going to be shocked at how deep I wanted y'all to go, and you didn't quite, some didn't quite go that deep, but we'll see. Um, I, I read your paper as if you're in an interview and they ask you the question, and I'm looking for really deep, deep answers, not a high level. Signal. So, I, you know, I, I kind of encourage people, you know, like it's hard for me to look at these in advance because I was great in another class. So I, I could only look at them really, really fast, but to make sure the basics were there. Um, so we'll, we'll see. And then the math questions I can answer, I can grade much faster. Hopefully you got all the math exactly right, because then I, I can grade really fast if your answer is right. When the answer is wrong, that's when it slows me down. It's like, oh, I wish you got this right. Um, so hopefully by Saturday, I'll have that there and then I'll bring the rubric next class. All right. I don't want to start something new. I know it's early. Questions on anything? Your paper one is really your focus right now. You don't need to worry about project two at all. Um, so, uh, and I'm still working on the United guy to come talk to us. He actually said, hey, I can come talk to you in person. So I said, fine, he's up in Dallas. But he says, I travel all the time. Obviously, he works for United, so I guess he travels all the time. So maybe he'll actually come here. So the way I do the uh, case studies is we cover about four or five case studies. And then on the final, you get to pick two or three of them discussed on the finals. And so his is the one where you'll have to come and take notes because there won't be any anything to reference other than his talk. But usually the actual case is one of the easier ones to talk about. So you'll probably want to use this as your case. So I'll, once we get closer, I'll have that set up. All right, I'll stop it a little bit early.